This is a resource of just loving God. The Narrow Way, a cry to the lost and weary, from Proverbs 14, 12. We join the service underway. Just let the presence of the Lord rest in your heart now. Just rest in him. Just rest. Almighty King, there is no one like you. Lord, we just bow. We bow before you. We know nothing else to do, Lord, just to bow and to adore and to praise and to thank. Lord, you who look down upon us poor souls and said, I will go for them. For there is no one else to go. I will go. I will go and I will lift their poor, dead, hopeless souls into life. And Lord God, we thank you that that day came. Oh, and your word just thundered into our souls. It was like a whisper and a thunder all at once. It was like a lamb and the roar of a lion all at once. It was so gentle and yet it threw mountains into the ocean inside us. Who is like unto thee, O Lord God, amongst gods? Who can declare your works? Who counseled you when you formed the heavens and the earth? When you set it upon its foundations, who gave you advice? None. For you alone, Lord, are God. We ask you again this evening, Lord, whisper and thunder. Just whisper and thunder into hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to talk to three people tonight. I'm talking to, therefore, everyone in the room. If you truly know God, and I mean truly know God, I'm talking to you. But I'm also talking to you if you, you prayed a prayer many years ago. You talked to God. Something in you drew you, and yet you know inside you don't really know him yet. It's not really what you've heard talked about, but you want it to be. And I'm also talking to you who are resisting God. I'm talking to you if you are fighting the Holy Spirit who's calling you. And he has been calling you for a long time, and you know he has. I'm talking to you too. Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I wanted to share these because this is urgent. Time is short. None of us knows whether we will wake up tomorrow morning. None of us knows that. We don't know. And that's not to be depressing, that's just to be honest. We don't know. And so, time is urgent. Romans 13 verse 12 tells us that the night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And Jesus said this in Revelation 22. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. And in Luke 12, 19, he tells a parable of a man who built bigger and bigger barns to store his great wealth that he loved so much. And Jesus said this, the man will say, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, play your guitar, yeah. <laughs> be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So there is an urgency and it's real. And I could not possibly say that I love you if I didn't tell you this. I couldn't. I would be a liar. 
And it says here that, in Proverbs 14, that there is a way that seems right to a man, but, the, but its end is the way of death. So things may seem okay, they may seem right, they may seem good even. And it's so weird, this. It's so strange that the most dangerous thing sometimes seems the best thing. It seems the coolest thing. It seems the most practical or obvious thing to do. It's the thing that's most fun. It's got the quickest short-term gain. So it seems right. It seems good. I made a little graphic for you to illustrate this. There is a way that seems right, taking a selfie and swimming with a shark, but its end is death. But even laughter and fun and pleasure are very often what cause us to say, well, just relax, my soul. It's okay. Eat, drink, be merry, and to have that attitude. But also, strangely, so can misery and pain and distress and trouble cause us to do this. We say, life is so hard, well, I may as well just eat and drink and have a blast and just who cares? So either way, we can end up on this strange pathway where it seems right, but its end is death. And these strange thoughts that can get into the human mind can lead you to avoid that big question. What happens when I die? And oh man, men and women have been running from that question forever. So there are two roads you can walk on. There's just two, there's not three, there's not one, there's just two. One is narrow and one is really wide. One is hard and one is easy. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. This is what Jesus said. He said, Lord, that's a hard word. That makes no sense. But Jesus is saying here, there's two narrow things. There's the gate and the way. Both are narrow. And who is the gate? Jesus Christ. He says, is Jesus narrow? Yeah, because he's the only way. He alone can save. Not Buddha, not the Pope, not some priest or some shaman, no one but Jesus can save. And it's by grace, and it's through faith only. But then the way and the road, he says, are also narrow. What did he mean? He means that this walk up this road is a way of life that is a life of endlessly dying. It's dying to your body's desires and your mind's ideas. In other words, it's ongoing sanctification. That's a big word. It means complete transformation inside. And this sanctification is evidence that you've entered through Jesus Christ. If you've come into new life through Jesus Christ, you will find that your whole life is defined by a desire to obey him and a desire to be transformed by him. You don't want to stay the same. So this way then, it's interesting, the way. The early Christians called Christianity the way. That's what they called it, the way. Six times in the book of Acts, it's called the way. It's not called Christianity at that time. It's called the way. In other words, Christianity is not a one-off decision that you just made. It's a way of life. And it's also narrow. It's narrow in two ways. Firstly, it's limited by what God says, not what you want. It's just narrow that way. You can't do what you want. It's just limited by what he says. In other words, you have to obey the Bible. And you have to understand that Jesus is the way. We follow a person, not a code of conduct. It doesn't make us a good person by keeping rules. We try hard to do that sometimes, but that's not how we're made righteous. So we're limited in this way. It's narrow because it's limited by what God says and does. And we're following this person, Jesus. Secondly, it's narrow because it's marked by challenges and hardship. 
It's not broad and easy and you can flail your arms around. It's narrow. You can't do that. It's not, it's not easy. It's not simple. And yet it's so simple. Yeah. It goes against your flesh. Everyone will tell you you're wrong. The devil will fight you. People come into salvation life, new life, and they, they say to me, oh, this is amazing. It's going to be wonderful. And I tell them, welcome to the front line. You have just been airlifted into the battle of the Somme. There's mortars flying. Welcome to the team. And you know, all this challenge is wonderful in this narrow way. It's designed by God to transform you. Through the fiery trials of this world, from both the devil and from your own flesh, the Christian's faith is proven genuine. It's refined to greater and greater degrees of purity until it is shining like the purest gold. That's what the trouble's for. And also various trials and troubles are encountered in the narrow way that lead to a greater degree of Christian virtue or holiness, if you like. Tribulation, that's trouble, produces perseverance. And perseverance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. Because you begin to learn, aha, I see, Lord, I see what you're doing. The testing of our faith produces endurance that we may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's what this narrow way does. God describes himself as a refiner, a smelter of gold and silver. You know what a smelter does? Puts the heat on, melts you. Ultimately, God is the one disciplining his children. It says in Hebrews, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. Oh, what a father he is. And guess what? You might not know this. You might not like this. He even uses Satan to smash the hammer down. And he's melted you just... You're glowing red hot like metal. And he's put you on the anvil and he says, okay, Satan, have a swing. And you go, whoa, God uses the devil? Oh yes, the devil is God's servant. He's not in charge, he has no authority, he has no power. God says, have a swing, I'll let you do the sweating. And as he swings, bang, it hits you. And then he turns it over. And he goes, go on, have another swing. Bang! He thinks he's destroying you. And all he's doing is forming you into the perfect conformity to Christ. Oh, what a fool the devil is. Amen. What a wonderful father we have. David said in Psalm 17, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. He knew he was being changed through all the troubles that David had to endure, hunted like a dog through the, the, the wilderness by Saul. And in the midst of all that, God formed him to be the man who could carry out the calling that God had for him. You see, for Christians, those who truly know the Lord, not for anyone else, mind, but for Christians, God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Just know, if you've had the discipline of the Lord, oh, you are loved. You are being shaped and forged and formed his workmanship. So true Christians are able to rejoice, increasingly so as they gain wisdom in this. Even though the distress is here for a little while, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to you, O Christian. So this narrow way into Christianity and then this narrow walk of obedience and this really rough training will create a beautiful harvest of peace and righteousness in you if you're his son. It will. And if you're not his son, then you get none of this elite training. And the promises of eternal life don't apply to you. 
You're on the wide way. God is narrow. So what of this wide way then? This other option that there is for humans. Psalm 58 verse 3 says, Wicked people are born sinners. Even from birth they have lied and gone their own way. And if you're honest, you know that's what you were like. You didn't need any help doing evil. You didn't need any help at all lying and doing wrong. That's how we're born. Isaiah said all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. There's no exceptions here. We're born right bang smack in the middle of the wide way. That's where the maternity unit sits for all humanity. There's no struggle, is there, to enter that wide gate and then walk that wide path. It's not hard, it's natural. It suits our nature. It doesn't resist our impulses this wide way. It's easy and it's natural and everyone will tell you you're on the right road. The devil won't stop you. It seems right. No, the end thereof is death because by nature, you are a lover of self, a lover of money, a lover of this world, a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. That's the nature of man. We're controlled willingly by the lust of our flesh, by the lust of our eyes and by the boastful pride of life. On this path, you think you have freed yourself from the tyrant of heaven, the one who restricts and binds and chains you down. That's what you think. But in so doing, you've subjected yourself to the tyranny of your own deceptive, depraved, self-destroying heart. And if you're honest, you know that's true. You've traded the truth for an idol of your own pleasure. By nature, a child of God's wrath. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. John 3, 36 just a bit after John 3:16, which we know, for God so loved the world, oh yes, that he sent his only begotten son. And then in verse 36, Jesus goes on and he says, whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is the Jesus, the son who was sent, not to bring condemnation, but to bring life. And he's warning us, obey me. Obey me, or my holiness and the wrath that that must bring in justice rests upon you still. Proverbs 7.22 says that like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. It seems right, but it's so dangerous. And the problem with this broad, wide gate and way is that it just gets darker and darker and darker every day. And if you're honest, you know that's true. It gets darker. It doesn't get lighter, this pathway. It gets darker, even in our laughter and our mirth and our self-medication, it gets darker. Proverbs 4 says, the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. And if you go back one verse, it compares that to the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. What a difference on these two pathways. One is hard and narrow. Oh, but it's brightening. With every step that we squeeze through, it's brightening and brightening and brightening. With every opposition and resistance from Satan or our own flesh, it brightens and brightens and brightens and brightens. And we change and change and change and change. But on the wide way, it seems so easy. You know, I can swing my arms, I can dance, I can do whatever I like. I can roll around. But it's getting darker and I, I just trip every now and again. And then I, I trip a bit more and I, know, I can't even see anymore what I'm tripping over. And so it gets darker and darker. But somehow it still seems right to the darkened heart. And you know what's most terrifying to me? Is that it seems almost no churches are prepared to disturb 
those walking on the wide way. There's no warning. There's no challenge. And dare I say it, there's no love. How can they love someone if they don't tell them they're about to fall off a cliff? If you saw anyone, let's be honest, if you saw anyone about to be hit by a truck, you would do everything you could to grab them, would you not? You'd shout, oi, look out. Maybe you'd run in, you'd boom, you'd smash them across to the other side of the road just to get them out of the way of that truck. Even if it meant you got hit, you would. But how few in pulpits are prepared to do that? So there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Because the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what is this end that this verse is talking about? The end of this is the way to death. What is this end? What, is, what are these wages? What do they look like? We need to know this, not only for our own sakes, but so that we can truly warn others. We need to understand what Jesus said. Eternal life is a common phrase in the Bible. We read about eternal life. That means life that just never stops. But there's also eternal death. Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus said this. Jesus said this. This is the one who was sent to save. He said, these will go away into eternal punishment. This is called hell. And we have to understand the nature of hell and the severity of it, the endlessness of punishment for your sin. You must know what this is. How terrible must sin be for that to be the punishment? If sin wasn't really that bad, it would just be, well, God says, that was bad. Don't do that again. Come on in. It's fine. But he can't because he is just. So how terrible must it be? Daniel 12 tells us many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Isaiah tells us that their worm shall not die. Their fire shall not be quenched. Matthew 25, Jesus describes this place as a place of outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't like the sound of that. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul says this, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Jude says it's the punishment of eternal fire. In Revelation 14, it says the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. So that is the end. That is the wages that the Lord is talking about. You know, your body is supposed to be the temple of God. That's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be the place where God lives, but it's become infected by sin. All humanity has the same infection. And so it means that the broad way sinner cannot have God living there as well. It defiles the temple. It's like, do you remember when Jesus came into the temple with a whip and he turned over all the tables and he, he drove them out. He said, this is my father's house of prayer. And it's the same in our hearts. We are meant to be a house of prayer. Yeah. And we need the Lord of glory to come with a whip and drive out the things that would take us to that end where those wages are. This, this temple, this broad way walking temple laughs at God's holiness so that you just can't be with God in heaven. The sinner must be cast out of the camp. He has to be because God is clean and pure and holy. And that's why hell has to be separate from the presence of the Lord and the glory of the Lord. That's why there's weeping. That's why there's gnashing of teeth. There's no place of shelter there in the burning heat. So how severe must God see sin in our lives that it necessitated himself becoming one of us? But Romans 6, 23 has this good news. The wages of sin is death, yes. And the sentence of death is upon you if you do not know God. But the free gift of God is eternal life 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. That means forever and ever you will live in Christ, inseparable from his glory and his holiness and his beauty. Imagine all of your sin washed away, everything that defiled you and drove you gone. So hear the call of Jesus tonight. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Whoever, Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. But, oh, there's that blessed but. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Isaiah tells us that the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show mercy to you. And Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. Right here. Closer than the breath you breathe. Closer than a brother. Acts 2, verse 38, Peter stood up at the day of Pentecost. And he cried out, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is a promise of God. The free gift of God is eternal life. Notice this, sin you earn wages from. Life, you can't earn it, it's a free gift. Is it a gift if you demand it? If you came up to me now and said, Philip, Give me a gift. And I gave you my laptop. Would that be a gift? If you woke up one morning and you just decided to go and ask someone for a nice thing, would that really be a gift? Not really. If you paid for it, would it be a gift? Okay, well, what if you paid for half of it? Is that that's not a gift? What about just 5% of it, if you just paid for that? Is it really a gift? Mm. So eternal death you can earn. It's a wage that death, and no one but you can choose hell for you. No one. You shouldn't fear the people who can hurt your body. You should have deep fear and reverence for him who can kill both the body and the soul in hell. That's what Jesus said. Have reverence for God. Turn to this one. The Holy Spirit and the church, that's the bride of Christ, say, come, Lord, come. Come to us. Return. Do you say that? Will you say that? Will you believe that the death penalty that may still be hanging over you tonight was suffered by Jesus on the cross as your substitute? Will you believe that? If you do not know him, there is a death penalty hanging over you. And it is irrevocable because justice will be served. But will you believe that one came, his name is Jesus Christ, and he took that death penalty for you? Will you believe that your nature is utterly against God and it's an abomination to him and that you need Jesus's righteousness to cover you? Will you believe that? Will you believe that if you believe all this with all your heart that you will be utterly transformed inside? Will you believe that? I'm telling you, it's true. And that every lust and addiction and drive and passion and motive and even your thinking, the thinking that has destroyed you, will be changed. It's true. Will you believe it today? Will you believe that a miracle can happen? Will you humble yourself and admit your need? We sang it earlier. Not because you did bad things, but because your deepest nature is rotten and rebellious and stony and hopelessly lost. Will you humble yourself and admit your need, this need of mercy, this need of a gracious savior to take it all into his own body on Calvary? Will you humble yourself and give yourself to this one who promises to give you new life inside? A new heart. Imagine the very center of you changed. And real righteousness. 
instead of your own exhausting attempt to be a good person or a better person. It's so exhausting. Will you ask him now to save you, those of you who do not truly know this one? Will you? It's a challenge. This isn't a sermon. This is a plea from me to you. You you don't need someone to save you from your addiction or your trouble or your pain. Oh, he'll do that. You need someone to save you from eternal death. You need someone to save you from this way that has seemed right, painful though it is, has somehow still seemed right, but which ends in the darkest torment forever. Will you ask this one to save? Will you ask this one to save you from the man you are inside? Not the man people see, but the man you are. You know, he's rich in mercy. Rich in mercy. That means he's a whatever's more than a trillionaire, a gazillionaire in mercy. And he so generously lavishes that mercy on all who call upon him. What I say is true. Many of you here know this. He's very kind. He's very forgiving. Do not fear to come to him. Come to him now. Speak to him inside and mean it with every ounce of your being. Psalm 86 says, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. All means you. Lamentations 3, verse 22, beautiful words. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. In fact, they are new every morning. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Because Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But, but, but the free gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's time to say, with me has been impossible, but with you, all things are possible. Come and change my stony heart. Come and change, Lord, the darkness. Come and change the doubts and the fears and the terrors of the night. Come and drive away, Lord, the darkness that has shrouded me, Lord, like a cloak. Mm -hmm. Come, almighty Redeemer. You said if I I called, you would be merciful. The man said it. He told us tonight. He read from your Bible, and it says if I called, you would be merciful. So I just reach out my quivering hand and say, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. I need you. I've tried it on my own for so long, but I'm tired and I'm weary and I need you. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, your truth is ageless. It's eternal. It's the same old gospel that saved Paul, that saved me, a wretch, Lord, by grace. It's the same gospel, Lord, that will save those here under the sound of my voice, Lord, who do not know you. It's the same gospel that causes those who have been redeemed, Lord, to sing. It's the same gospel, the same good news that will save every man, woman, and child, Lord, who comes to you and cries out for mercy. Lord, nothing's changed. A sinner is still a sinner and the gospel is still the gospel. And Lord, it is the power of God to save all who believe. And Lord, I ask this evening that you would please come and whisper and thunder into souls tonight, Lord. Let no one leave this room, Lord, casually, thinking the same as they did when they came in. Let no one leave here the same, Lord. Almighty God, merciful Saviour, I ask you, Lord, to touch hearts tonight. I ask you, Lord, to continue drawing Continue convicting of sin. Continue showing them, Lord, and convincing them of your righteousness, Lord. Showing them the judgment to come and the fact that you took it for them. Oh, glorious Redeemer. We ask you this, Lord, in your name. Amen.